It's tough when you're walking on thin ice and you're not sure if a child is going to do well. Welcome to ICANN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Cedare Ziai and myself, Dr. Guillermo Rocha. This season, we have two new co-hosts joining us, Dr. Mona Dagger and Dr. Hadi Saheb. They'll be hosting upcoming episodes throughout the season. Season three of the ICANN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. We are joined today by Dr. Carol Shields, famed ophthalmologist and ocular oncologist, prolific author and researcher, director of the oncology service at the Wills Eye Hospital, and professor of ophthalmology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Born in Sharon, Pennsylvania, Dr. Shields attended the University of Notre Dame for undergraduate studies and played four years of varsity basketball on the women's basketball team serving as captain for three years. She completed her medical school at the University of Pittsburgh and residency in ophthalmology at Will's Eye Hospital. She subsequently completed fellowship training in ocular oncology, oculoplastic surgery, and ophthalmic pathology. Dr. Shields has authored or co-authored 12 textbooks, over 2,000 articles in major peer-reviewed journals, over 340 textbook chapters, She's given over a thousand lectureships, among which is the Harold Stein Lecture at this U.S. annual meeting last June. She serves on the editorial board of several journals, including JAMA Ophthalmology, Retina, Journal of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and International Journal of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Shields has received numerous professional awards. In addition to all these achievements, Dr. Shields and her husband, Dr. Jerry Shields, are the parents of seven children. She's also an avid sportswoman with interest in basketball, tennis, downhill skiing, biking, and hiking, among others. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Shields. What an honor and a privilege to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. You are so accomplished. You must be so organized and disciplined. I wonder if you can tell us a bit about a normal work day in your life. Sure. So we start our office fairly early in the morning. So generally I uh, wake up around five or five fifteen in the morning and I'm at work at six and office hours start at six, 6 a.m. We're the first office to open at Wills. And the reason we open early is because Back in the day when we had kids at home, I always wanted to be available for their sporting events that took place in the late afternoon. So I moved the office hours to very early in the morning. And actually our staff really likes it. They like the early morning because they too have families and they wanna get out to watch their child play soccer or lacrosse or whatever sport they they play. So we see patients from six o'clock to about two or three o'clock, then I have time to do my emails or whatever work I have to do. And I'm usually out of the hospital by about four or 4.30. That's an average work day. Wow. Um, How do you manage in the morning with the children? If being at work is at six? Yeah, so when we had, we have seven children and when they were home, they're all grown and gone at this point. So we're empty nesters. But when the children were younger, we always had two nannies. Um, Initially, we had two independent nannies, but later we had a husband and wife nanny. And um, the wife would generally come over early in the morning and get the kids ready for school. And the husband would drive them to school. And then they would take care of the house while they were at school and then pick them up from school. So the kids, I figured, I knew I couldn't be at home all the time. So I figured it was more important for me to be home for the after-school activities uh, rather than preparing and getting the children off to school. 
but having having a family and having a career there's always some given some something you can't do you can't do it all so i i had to reason it's probably best that i get started at work early so i can get home yeah balance any advice to young ophthalmologists on handling career and family yeah so i think it's important to realize that we're human beings and we we have needs and your children have needs and i think i think it's important to follow your heart so rather than saying I want two children and I'm going to have them when I'm 32 years old and I'm going to do this and that. It'll never work. You know, I had my children at the most inopportune times. For example, my first was born one week before my written boards and my second was born two weeks before my oral boards. <laughs> and it just was inopportune, but I followed my heart. I wanted to have a family. Some people don't want to ha have a family. They would rather, you know, do a lot of boating or whatever. So you follow your heart with what you want to do. And that's that's my advice for young people. Everything will fall into place. Don't over plan. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'm married to Dr. Jerry Shields, who's also an ocular oncologist. Do you talk about work at home? Do you do research at home? Or does work stop at the Will's Eye stores? <laughs> Mostly it stops at Will's Eye. So we both worked five days a week, but there were times where Jerry actually worked from home Tuesdays and Fridays uh, because he wanted to have more time with the children. So he would work Tuesdays at home. He would take the children to school and often he would go into school and eat lunch with them. Very different. Yeah, he, he wanted to do that. But generally when we came home from work, we didn't talk work. Um, now that we're empty nesters, sure, I get a little bit of work done on Saturday and Sunday when I have a little bit of free time. That's incredible. So you're always producing interesting and important research. Um, what do you feel has been the most exciting innovation in ocular oncology? Or is it yet to come? No, it's every five to 10 years, something major happens. And in ocular oncology, I think the most major change in my career was the introduction of chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. We had enucleation and external beam radiation when I entered the field. There was no chemotherapy. And then all of a sudden, in the early 1990s, in London, England, Judy Kingston realized that the protocol she was using for neuroblastoma was actually effective against retinoblastoma. And she kind of let the secret out to a few of the big centers, including the Toronto Center, the Philadelphia Center, and the um, Los Angeles Center. And all four of our centers, including London, started using systemic chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. And it was absolutely amazing. I think that is the single biggest innovation in the field of ocular oncology during my career. It has changed the prognosis of patients. It's totally changed the prognosis, totally saved lives and saved eyes. And actually, uh, when in one of our studies, we looked at visual outcomes in children who were you know, four years or older and had systemic chemotherapy. In those kids where we were able to save the eyes, 50% of children had 20, 40 vision or better. I mean, it gave gave them their lives back. And back in the day, I mean, I recall there were children we had to remove both eyes before chemotherapy. And now with chemotherapy and now with intra-arterial chemotherapy, we're saving even more lives and more eyes. So I think intra-arterial chemotherapy have been major innovations in the field of ocular oncology. With regard to melanoma, I don't know if we've yet seen a big step forward, but we're now with melanoma, we're understanding who's at risk for metastatic disease <clears throat> because we know based on genetics who will develop metastatic disease and we're testing protocols. And we do have approved medications now to treat metastatic disease with uveal melanoma.
Is there anything new you are working on nowadays? With regard to melanoma, you mean? Yeah. Yes. So there's two new alternatives, one on the front end and one on the back end. I'll start with the front end. We, over the years, every decade in the 1990s, in the 2000s, and then in the 2020s, we published risk factors predictive of nevus growth into melanoma. So we know we can predict what nevus is gonna grow into melanoma. That's on the front end of uveal melanoma. So if we can catch uveal melanoma when it's really small or just converting or has a lot of risk factors, we might be able to prevent melanoma. And we do have a medication. It's, it's called Belzupicap Seratalican. <laughs> it's a, a hard name. It's by Aura Incorporated and it's a nanoparticle therapy. And we shorten the name and we call it Belsar, B-E-L-S-A-R. This is a medication that we inject either into the vitreous or suprachoroidal, and it has a little photosensitive dye in it, and it's attracted to melanoma, and we shine a laser light into it that activates the medication and causes immediate necrosis of the melanoma. It's, it's under trial now. It's not FDA approved, but it could be a game changer. So that's on the front end of melanoma. On the back end of melanoma, we now have a new medication called Kimtrac. The generic name is Tebentafus. We call it Tebi for short, but the, the trade name is Kimtrac. And Kimtrac is now approved for treatment of uveal melanoma metastatic disease. It was just announced in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it significantly improves patient survival. And we're taking this drug, Kimtrac, and we're now going to use it to treat large melanoma while it's still in the eye and shrink it down and prevent METs, we hope, and shrink down the melanoma in the eye so the melanoma is small enough that we can actually treat it with plaque radiation. Our hope being avoid enucleation. Mm -hmm. We would like to avoid enucleation. And in Europe, they're going to start a trial with Kimtrac where they're going to be, they'll be using Kimtrac as an adjuvant. So they'll identify by genetics who's at risk for metastatic disease, and they won't wait for the Mets. They'll put them on Kimtrac to prevent the Mets. So we may be changing the face of uveal melanoma even as soon as the next five years, because we'll know, you know, most metastatic disease occurs within five years. It's very exciting. And yeah. I can feel your passion. I'd love to hear uh, your story. We can, we can go all the way back to the beginning. Can you tell us how you got interested in ophthalmology and then how did you choose ocular oncology? It's so rare. Yeah, it is. Um, so I've, I've always had a strong belief in myself and I garnered that while, I really garnered that when I was in high school and I was asked to give the graduation address. And I said, wow, little old me, they want me to give the, grad the commencement speech? So I gave the commencement speech. And I also won a little award. It was called the Bosch and Loam Award for Science. But that little award, which is nothing, I don't even have it. It was a medal. It's somewhere stored, I guess. I don't even know. But that little award gave me such self-confidence and caused me to believe that maybe I could be a scientist. So I went to college and studied science with the goal of going to medical school, but not knowing what I wanted to do. While in medical school, I gravitated towards subspecialties where I felt I could really excel. You know, I felt I could be an excellent dermatologist or an excellent rheumatologist or endocrinologist. But my older brother went into ophthalmology and I said, you know, I, I could be an ophthalmologist too. And it sort of influenced me. So I had a discussion with him. I have, I'm one of eight. So when you're in a big family, you always contact one of your siblings. And I called my brother, Pat, and I said, you know, I'm thinking of endocrine and derm. And he said, no, he says, you should go into ophthalmology. You can do it. And he says, 
you have, it's immediate gratification. You, you take out a cataract and the patient's happy the next day. He said, it's a wonderful field. So I went into ophthalmology. And while I was in residency at Will's Eye Hospital, it was the first year they took a number of women. You know, Will's used to have, if, if you're lucky, back in the 60s, maybe one or two women in 10 years. It was, you know, all males. And then when I was there, we had 13 residents per year and five were women. And I always joked that I was probably the last one to get into Will's because everyone was so smart. And, but I was learning from the greats. I was stood on the shoulders of legends at, at Will's. E everything I was taught was accurate and correct. And there was no guessing. And I was very happy to be there. And I met Jerry Shields on a, on a tennis court, no less. And my interest in athletics allowed me to meet him because I, I wasn't really a seasoned tennis player. I was a seasoned basketball player. And I believed in myself that I could play any sport. And we played tennis with two other people and they made the two of us partners. And that was the beginning of our relationship on a tennis court. It's so wonderful. Yeah, and he was unattached. He was a bachelor. He was married to ocular oncology. <laughs> he spent seven days a week in the hospital. He worked so hard from sunrise to sunset. I'm not saying he didn't have a social life. He did have a social life. <laughs> he was dating around. But we were a perfect match. Mm -hmm. You know, he, we saw eye to eye. We were both from very humble beginnings and we enjoyed academics. And our second date was to a 76ers basketball game. Wow. Yeah. And then after that, um, I hosted the Christmas party for our class wow. and uh, Jerry came over and everyone in the class said, what is he doing here? <laughs> he was, I mean, he was, a, he was unattached, you know, and then we just started hanging out together. And that stimulated my interest in ocular oncology. Ocular oncology back then was the wild, wild, wild West. <laughs> it was completely disorganized. I mean, they even had trouble at, at Will's. I mean, before Jerry started, Will saw five patients with uveal melanoma per year and one with retinoblastoma per year. No. I mean, that was nothing. And nowadays we see on average 500 patients with uveal melanoma per year and about 120 to 150 patients with retinoblastoma per year. So Jerry, and then when I joined them, the, the two of us really focused on ocular oncology and he was always an organizer and I was too but he organized himself to the point that we were able to write papers on each individual tumor. And I knew a little statistics and I like to do retrospective analyses and look at factors that predicted good outcomes or poor outcomes. And we were always working on 10 or 20 papers and we published a lot. And then we put out our atlases of intraocular tumors. And we took that wild west of ocular oncology and made it a very organized subspecialty. Uh, I'm not saying we did all the work. We had a lot of residents, fellows, observers, and then we had all our other colleagues. So, you know, we in ocular oncology, there I can count on one hand the number of prospective trials we've had. We just don't do it. Yeah. What a beautiful story. It's really uh, just incredible. What a match made in heaven. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's also goes to the, to what I said earlier for the young residents or young ophthalmologists, follow your heart, you know, don't, don't over plan, just follow your heart and things happen for a reason. That's great advice. Indeed. Take, take opportunities. I can 100%.
wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. My name's Bob Bell. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, used to run hospitals in Ontario, deputy minister in the Ministry of Health in Ontario. And I've had a long history of admiration for the ophthalmologists of Canada for the great care you provide. And I hope ophthalmologists enjoy this episode of the ICANN podcast. You really do heartwarming and grateful work. You save lives, not only sight. So certainly many patients are really thankful to you for their health. Do you find managing ocular tumors like retinoblastoma and choroidal melanoma emotionally tough? With all your experience in the years, has it become routine practice or does it still affect you deep down? It still affects me. It is, you're right, it is emotionally tough. It's not tough when you have a good outcome. It's tough when you're walking on thin ice and you're not sure if a child is gonna do well. So when, when I see a child with retinoblastoma, I, I always talk to the, the family heart to heart and I tell them we have three goals here. And goal number one is to save your baby's life. Number two is to save at least one eye. And number three, vision. We'll talk about vision later. Let's not get into vision right now. We have bigger things to achieve. We have to save your baby's life. And they, they realize the seriousness of this. We've, we're, we've been lucky of in the past 25 years of the children that we've treated from start in Philadelphia, we've only had one or two deaths. So we're very, very on top of our game. Uh, nothing slips through the cracks, but it's, it's not just me treating these. We, it's takes a village. Mm -hmm. We have pediatric oncologists. We have neurosurgeon. Uh, we, we have nurses, we have technicians, uh, we have radiation oncologists. I mean, it goes on and on the whole team we have who takes care of these children with retinoblastoma. But I do, I get, I get a little bit emotionally involved, but I don't show it. I always try to remain strong when talking to the families. Mm -hmm. And I tell the fellows, when you go out to talk to a family following a retinoblastoma exam under anesthesia, always start with something positive, like, you know, her right eye looks good. This is really totally under control, but her left eye, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. There are vitreous seeds coming back and we're gonna have to start the child on intravitreal chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. The good news is the intravitreal chemotherapy generally works. Usually within four months, we get everything under control, but there are toxicities. So we always start with something good so the family can hang their hat on something positive. Yeah, give them hope to continue. It's tough, it's really not easy. You are so well-renowned, yet so humble. What do you consider to be your biggest impact on ocular oncology or on the profession in ophthalmology in general? I think my biggest impact has been in my organization that allows me to be able to write papers and give talks without being totally frazzled. So I, I, when, when fellows come to us, the retina fellows or the oncology fellows or the residents, I have them work with me in the clinic to see how organized we are in the clinic. But I also open my computer and I tell them, I wanna show you how I organize myself in the computer. So I hope they can take some of my organization and simplify their life. Like I keep all my webinars like this, organized. You know, everything's organized by year, month, day. And then every email on this podcast is organized. Uh, so it allows me, my organization allows me to be available to everybody. So I work, I work with medical, medical students a lot. I have every, every summer we host about 20 medical students who come and do research with us 
and work right on the front line with us. They're right in the office with us. They're moving patients, even examining patients. And so I can work with them from the medical students, even up to the experienced fellows. And it doesn't quite frazzle me. I think that's my biggest impact. That's wonderful. And you have been very prolific at it. It just takes energy, discipline, being focused, and yeah, very organized, yeah. as you say. You have to be organized. It's very laudable. And you. can can we go back and talk about your basketball prowess? I know yeah, you were yeah. the captain of the basketball team at Notre Dame. You went into the Hall of Fame at Notre Dame. And recently, and on behalf of all of the COS, congratulations on the Teddy Award. Can you talk to us more about the Teddy Award and what that means to you? Yes. I, I mean, if you ask, would ask me what, what is the biggest award in your career, it was the Teddy Award. Mm -hmm. it, it was surreal. I received a phone call from the University of Notre Dame. Now, I graduated in 1979. I mean, I'm long gone from Notre Dame, but I still maintain contact. I still go out for football games. I still maintain contact with the athletic department, et cetera. It's wonderful. I've, I've given lectures out there. I, I've, I've done a lot over the years. And of course, I provide charitable funds too, because I, I think it's important to give back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got a phone call from the assistant athletic director, Missy Conboy. She said, Carol, sit down. I have to talk to you about something. I didn't know what she was going to say. <laughs> I always think, oh, what did I do wrong now? But <laughs> she says, you were nominated for the Theodore Roosevelt Award of the NCAA. And you won. I said to her, what is it? <laughs> I and I quickly, I was near my computer. I quickly Googled it and I almost fell over. Mm -hmm. I said, you mean I won the Teddy Award? And it's a it's an, an award that is given not just for athleticism, but for your life. It's a life achievement award yeah. for players in the NCAA who have gone on in their profession to make an impact. And um, yeah. he said, yeah, you won it. And it's going to be on January 11th, 2023. And you got to carve out time and you have to cancel patients and you have to be there. <laughs> she said, you, this is not going to be virtual. And um, I said, I'll be there. And uh, it was surreal. So, I mean, so fast forward to the day of the Teddy Award. I wrote, they, they sent me an e many emails, but one email says you cannot speak for more than four minutes. So I was the only one who was allowed to speak on stage. They gave several different awards to NCAA athletes. And um, the, this was the highest honor. Yeah, the highest honor went to me, the Teddy Award, and they allowed me to give a four minute talk. So in my talk, and it's online, in my talk, I interwove EUA for retinoblastoma with playing a basketball game. <laughs> wow, how did you do it that? Was, it was a really good talk. Amazing. I talked about the pressures of a jump shot mm -hmm. and the, the the perfection of the jump shot and the flick of your wrist and the the height you need to gain and the perfection of a laser next to the foveola in a kid that you could impact their future vision for life, how you have to believe in yourself when you're going up in the air for that jump shot and you're putting that laser in their macula. Mm -hmm. And I talked about the, the perfection of even a single dribble in basketball and how it impacts the outcome in retinoblastoma. And so I just wove it in and out. And some people told me they were crying when they heard wow. it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted the audience to know how sports, you know, the practice that goes into sports, it's the same practice that goes into medicine. We practice seeing that vitreous seed and recognizing is it active or inactive? If it's active, we got to act on it. You know, it's just, it's so much the same. Indeed. 
Yeah. What positions did you play? So I was a guard, but I often played forward. Um, usually I was point guard. Uh, some very interest, very interesting point is that my sister Maggie actually made the Notre Dame team too. Okay. So there were two sisters playing. We grew up in a household, everyone played basketball. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. We just had bikes and basketball and, <laughs> and tree houses. And that's basically all we did as kids. And my dad was smart. He installed lights. So we would play basketball until 10 p.m. because the lights came on. And I had five brothers and uh, two sisters, and we all played. And then all the neighbor kids came over. And uh, my sister Maggie and I learned street basketball, and we learned all the moves. And there was no stopping us, and she could read me. My, I was better on defense than I was on offense. If anyone came near me dribbling the ball, it was gone. I'd, ha I'd have it in my hand. And Maggie knew if they were within two steps of me, she took off down the court <laughs> because she knew I'd have the ball in her hands. And we didn't even have to look at each other. It was so much fun. It was fun playing basketball with her. And she was, she was a great point guard, super fast on the court. And uh, her passing was incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. So who is your favorite basketball player of all time? Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant? Well, I like Tyrese Maxey. He plays for the Sixers right now. He mm -hmm. is all over the court. He is fast. He's laughing the whole time he's playing. I like, I think I like him the best. Mm -hmm. I like his style. I like when players uh, really have fun out there. They're happy. Uh, you, you can see they enjoy what they're doing. It seems to me your favorite team is in 76ers. 76ers. Yeah. yeah. I like the 76ers. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, well done. That's incredible. Um, if we go back to uh, the annual meeting, we hosted you in Halifax in 2022 mm -hmm. in June, back in a few months ago. Uh, sure. you, just, you spoke passionately about women in ophthalmology. Do you have any advice for younger women ophthalmologists or even for younger generation ophthalmologists in general? Yeah. Um, when I entered the field of ophthalmology, maybe 10% of ophthalmologists were female. It's nowadays in, in the Wills residency, it's 50-50. So there's many more women in ophthalmology. And I think that's a good thing. Um, women tend to be very good with their hands. They tend to be uh, very good surgeons, as are men. And I think it's important for women uh, to support women and men. I don't, I don't, you know, divide women and men. I think it's important for all of us to support each other. I think when you're starting off in your career, it's highly important to have one or a few senior people who are kind of your mentors, who kind of steer you through your career path because when you're just starting off it's it's hard to get noticed or it's hard to and it doesn't even have to be an ophthalmologist it could be anyone in medicine and it doesn't have to be same sex it could be you know jerry kind of helped me through my career but also bill tasman did and gary brown did these are people who were in retina who guided me through my career so I think it's important to have one or a few mentors who look out for you. I saw, also think it's important to have a good network. Have a, a friend who's a good plastic surgeon in, in town that you can always, if, if you have a plastic case that you don't feel comfortable with, you can always send to them and they'll see the patient. Or a good retina consultant or a good neuro consultant. And you'll naturally develop your circle of networking and that's that's important too and i i think it's important for young people to also strike a balance the balance that i had was i want a family and i want a career and i don't really need to have leadership positions while i have a family because it takes too much time so i basically kept my life as simple as possible i came home i did not I didn't allow myself to get on a lot of different committees only because it took away from my kids' time. Mm -hmm. So I went to work and then I came home. As the kids 
grew up and had their own things and they, you know, moved to college, then I started to assume some leadership roles. And despite all of that, you've been so productive. You're so world are you now. You've yeah. not accomplished a lot. It's just impressive. Yeah. So this goes back to my organization. Um, again, you know, we, we have early office hours, but I also block off Friday for research, for podcasts, for <laughs> doing fun things at home or just taking a walk. You know, I used to do the kids' uh, pediatricians' visits on Friday. Friday was my day to get everything done that I couldn't get done during the week. I see. That's a smart thing to do. Yeah. Not everyone can block off time like that, but it is. I think it is uh, wise to have even a half day blocked off just so you know that you have a little bit of time to get, you know, the loose strings put back in order. Very true. Um, globally, COVID remarkably changed the medical profession. Has Have you seen it impact ocular oncology as well? Wait times for surgeries? Are there continued problems right now for you? COVID absolutely plummeted <laughs> our, our practice. Mm -hmm. So COVID hit in March 2020. Our practice slowly dropped. And by May, we were down to maybe three patients, three new patients a week. Normally we have, you know, 30, 35 new patients a week and it plummeted. And the problem with COVID was patients weren't getting into their general ophthalmologist. And so the general, so tumors were growing. And then at, in the end of 2020, we saw very large tumors retinoblastomas were out of control. We were enucleating much more than we did normally. So normally, you know, if a patient, patients with melanoma, for example, we might enucleate 6% of our patients, but during COVID, we had maybe 12 to 15% came to enucleation because tumors were just out of control. Yeah, sad, very sad. But there were some good things that happened during COVID. You might say, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, things happened. It opened the door for telehealth. Mm -hmm. And we quickly established three satellite offices. We had one east of Philadelphia, one west of Philadelphia, and uh, one northwest of Philadelphia, I should say, and one south of Philadelphia. And each are about 30 to 60 minutes outside Philadelphia. And in these three satellites, we have cameras and exam rooms, and we sent one doctor and one photographer there, and we would see our patients outside Philadelphia because patients did not want to come to the city. They were right. afraid to come in. So we would quickly do their evaluation, and I would sit either in the Philly office or in my home, and I had access to all the images because they were on our HIPAA-protected website, and I would review all the images. And we still keep these satellites open even to this day and patients love it, love it. So these were all follow-up patients who didn't have to come into Philadelphia. So our Northwest suburb will capture the New York patients and a lot of the Pennsylvania patients. Our mm -hmm. Eastern satellite will ca capture all the New Jersey patients. And we've kept them open and it's worked very, very nicely. So something good came out of it after that was that. the good that <laughs> out of uh, COVID. Yeah. And it's, it's really pushed us. I mean, the other good is our ability to do this zoom here today. Sure. How many zooms have we done? Wow. You know, <laughs> so many. Yeah. COVID uh, taught us really fast. You know, I used to think before COVID, I used to think, you know, why the, the online industry of, holding virtual meetings isn't going forward. There's something wrong. People, I guess, like to be with people. But when COVID struck, we learned that we can do meetings uh, without leaving our living room. Yeah, definitely. Um, there aren't many ocular oncologists, not in Canada. I don't think in the States either. You're one of those pioneers and people really look up to you. 
So if someone is interested in oncology, what would you tell them? What is your recommendation? Recommendation is uh, take a fellowship. <laughs> uh, if you're really interested in ocular oncology um, and there's several fellowships uh, in the States, I know, and I'm sure there are fellowships in Canada. And when you do a fellowship, you want to go to a fellowship that is going to teach you everything and keep you very busy. You, you When you're in a fellowship, you want to be very busy because you want to see everything. You don't want to learn the hard way and go out into practice and then have to say, oh, how, what do I do here? So we offer, we have, generally we have um, five research fellows each year and two clinical fellows. The clinical fellows scrub in with us and see all the patients, but the research fellows actually work in the clinic with us too. And they do a lot of research. And we teach them all about eyelid, conjunctival, orbital and intraocular oncology it's the it's the oh, real it's deal right. it's everything mm -hmm. ocular oncology is a great field it's a wide open field i mean there are a few fields in ophthalmology that are wide open ocular oncology pediatric ophthalmology mm -hmm. neuro ophthalmology and ophthalmic pathology they're all wide open yes indeed big need i mean there was an article that just came out in GMA ophthalmology about the need for pediatric ophthalmologists. Yes, yeah. same situation in Canada, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, being an ocular oncologist means you have to know a little or a lot about retina. Mm -hmm. You don't just learn about the tumors, you have to learn what are the pseudo tumors, you know? Mm -hmm. So we know we have to know a little bit about retina, a little bit about plastics, a little bit about cornea. A yeah. little bit about neuro because it all blends in with the various tumors that we see and the pseudo tumors. So the one thing I say to our fellows is, you know, you can learn to sew on a plaque, you can learn how to give the chemotherapy, but you, you also want to learn how to differentiate the pseudo tumors. I mean, f with regard to retinoblastoma of all the cases sent to us for possible retinoblastoma, about 25% are not retinoblastoma. Wow. You know, the retinal astrocytic hamartoma or their Coats disease or their Toxicara or whatever. So yeah. one out of four, that's mm -hmm. still a lot. And you have that's to be. Yeah. 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 And how do you encourage the new residents into liking the field of on ocular oncology? We want people to take on these physicians and yet they, the choice is not that easy. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's selection bias. I think the people who go into ophthalmology go into this field because, you know, they want to do cataract surgery or they want to do retina surgery or whatever it was that influenced them in the first place. And they're not, you know, if you want to go into oncology, you go into medical oncology and you go that route. So, they're not really seasoned to go into ocular oncology because they went into ophthalmology in the first place to do cataract surgery. So it's a little bit more challenging to get people interested in ocular oncology. But I think once they see the surgeries and the variety and the happy patients and the tremendous satisfaction, tremendous satisfaction. I mean, every day patients are, you know, thanking us for saving their child's life or thanking us for saving their life or thanking us, even though they have count fingers vision for treating that small melanoma in their eye. You know, I think if a resident wants a very gratifying field, ocular oncology is a very gratifying field. And we're very thankful to you, Dr. Shields, for being such a great role model. It's really laudable, the work you've done and the influence you've had on so many fellows and residents and many generation of ophthalmologists. Yeah. And uh, you know, when I was a medical student, I never thought of ocular oncology. You know, I wanted ophthalmology for, again, the instant gratification of cataract surgery. Uh, yeah. It's just, I bumped around during my residency career and 
you know, met Jerry and found the, the, I really had interest in ocular oncology and just dug in my heels and rolled up my sleeves and got to work. Yeah. And I've really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed my career. And I've, you know, if I look back in the rear view mirror, I'm very satisfied with um, all that we've done over the years and all the people we've met and the patients that we've helped, you know, and it's not, you know, you don't go in this into, you don't go into the field of ophthalmology for monetary gratification. You go into the field of ophthalmology because you want to serve patients with their most precious sense, the sense of sight. Well said. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So as we close each episode of the podcast, we like to ask our guests about some of their non-professional life activities. What's your favorite hobby? What do you do? What keeps you busy outside of work? I am an artist. I, you know, I enjoy fundus drawings. I shade them. I take my time and the, <laughs> our fellows can't believe I still do fundus drawings, but taking that out of work um, over the years, I've d done oil painting, acrylic painting, watercolors. In fact, funny story, almost 40 years ago, I did a watercolor of a Calibri hummingbird. Wow. Where the Calibri forceps gets its name. Mm -hmm. It looks like the Calibri hummingbird. Mm -hmm. And I painted it in, I don't know if it was like a tiger lily, getting some some of the pollen. And I gave it to this guy I was dating, Jerry Shields. <laughs> and I said, wishing you a great life. Wow. Sincerely, Carol Lally. I gave it to him for Christmas, never That's thinking so I'd be marrying him. <laughs> That's incredible. That was, that was a watercolor. Um, so currently um, I do less watercoloring. I do more photography. Um, okay. I, I had, I've had, years and years of photography. I have had many different cameras. I have telephoto cameras. I've photographed soccer, whatever. And I make photo albums, uh, digital photo albums that I print. So I do it through, I mean, I'm a Mac user and I do it through Mac iPhoto. Mm -hmm. And I have probably four or 500 photo albums of our kids at each stage, every like important event, like, you know, a first communion or a graduation. I have a little photo album because wow. I wanted to document their lives, you know, and it was fun for me to do it. You have so many hidden talents. <laughs> Keep I learning and talent. learning. That's impressive. Really wonderful. It's been really a true honor for us. You're extremely hardworking. You really set the bar very high. Your achievements are outstanding and you're yet so humble and so well respected around the world. It was really a pleasure hearing you speak today and your motivation and your sporting prowess. Um, it's truly inspirational. So I'm sure all our listeners will love hearing you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shields, for your time and for your, all your wise words today. Thank you, Mona. I really appreciate the interview and I'm happy to be a part of ICANN. Thank you, Dr. Shields. ICANN wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. Season three of the ICANN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. Thank you to the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. The ICANN podcast is written and directed by Kim Teitler and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works.